Welcome back to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast where we explore what's possible in the world of investing. If you've just joined us for the first time, a huge welcome to the community. My name is Bryce, and today I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you? I'm very good, Bryce. Very excited for this episode. We're speaking to an expert investor, Michael Frazis, Mm. who is all about growth. We first met Michael in, I guess, what you what we would look back and call the go go years of 2020 <laughs> and 2021. Yeah, and um, his fund was absolutely ripping, uh, investing in all of the high flying growth names. Yeah, big time. Um, and then obviously, as all growth managers suffered through 2022, 2023 was tough. But God, his fund is back up eight more than 80 percent for 2024. So. Mm. There's opportunity there if you can find it. Today, we are going to sit down and understand that journey. He's a, <laughs> he's a pretty young fund manager. And so I think um, it's, uh, we're looking forward to hearing some of the insight and just the emotional, I guess, struggles of going from absolute highs to rock bottom lows and, and now coming back. Uh, if you haven't heard of Michael before, he is the founder of Frazis Capital. Uh, As Ren said, we spoke to him back in 2021. Michael has a Master of Chemistry from the University of Oxford and a Master of Finance from the London School of Economics. Mm. So, um, yeah, very smart guy. And uh, today we're going to hear about the latest on his portfolio, some of the positions in there. Yeah, Uh, He's been writing in video. I know that. It'd be interesting to see where he's at with that. Um, But yeah, I love chatting to Michael. Yeah, yeah, the... Conversation around the biotech companies for me is always fascinating. Mm. Um, and there's been some really good stories come out of Australia recently. Uh, Telix Pharmaceuticals, some people may have heard of, and Clarity Pharmaceuticals, another one. Mm. Uh, I know Michael has been right in the middle of, I think, both of them, definitely mm. Clarity. So it'll be interesting to get his perspective on these biotech plays as mm. well. Mm. Yeah. Well, without further ado, let's uh, bring in Michael. Well, Michael, welcome to Equity Mates. Thanks. Good to be back. So for those who haven't heard our previous interviews with you, let's start at the top. How would you describe your investment philosophy? Look, we're pretty focused on growth, tech and biotech and healthcare, those kinds of sectors in particular. The way we like to phrase it is, you know, we look for companies with explosive growth, true customer love, uh, and we now have a really tight risk management around it, which kind of developed over the last year or so, <laughs> which we can talk uh, in, in detail on the pod. Nice. Um, but it's actually... A, it's a, it's, a, it's a crazily effective framework, really, when you think about it. I mean, it originally came from investing early on in companies like Tesla, Apple. Um, the idea of customer love, it kind of starts with the customer and the business rather than I think most financial analysts come at it the other way, you know, at the other end when you're trying to find things that might excite investors um, or like numbers that look really good or something that's cheaper relative to its, its peers. But often the really high returns come when the market is just so much bigger than anybody expects. You know, and you go from selling, you know, a handful of iPhones to early adopters to, you know, most wealthy consumers on the planet. And often there's really good signs of that. You know, products will be selling out. Um, there will be a waiting list. There will be, you know, several months to get a Tesla to go back to that example. You know, there's often like clues that you can see that there's immense demand. Um, and in business, that's the real, the real challenge in business is demand. You know, it's selling a product. It's having customers who will pay up and ideally pay a, a healthy margin for. Like that's the tough bit. That's the bit that very few companies can do. But there are companies that are able to consistently do that. Um, and it comes from the customer. It comes from customers being willing to pay. So, you know, to use the Apple example, there were years where the smartphone industry made no money, but Apple took the entire industry's profit margin. So everybody else was competing on features. They all had, you know, a similar size phone. Um, with sometimes even better camera, they're all like competing on features, you know, and price. And that, but then there was the iPhone, which was a cut above, um, more expensive, thirty to forty percent, you know, higher price, and that was a profit margin in the entire industry. Mm. And there was a period in our uh, autos is often like that as well, actually, which is why the Tesla example is interesting because you know most cars have kind of what is it, convergent evolution? Like they all just look the same. Mm-hmm. It's like all sedans are the same, all SUVs are the same. If any car company gets too experimental, usually they regret it. Because um, <laughs> usually it's the same you know, SUV shape that people want. Yeah. Mm. But then you have a handful of companies, not just Tesla, but say Ferrari, for example, who can charge that enormous premium. And then they capture all the profits and everybody else has to compete on features, price. And there's usually only one or two cost leaders uh, in any given industry. So yeah, that's the framework. I think also the explosive growth is important. So that's really looking at companies growing at 50% plus, ideally over 100% year on year. So instead of saying, 
is this company going to do well? Is this company selling things or making things that people want to buy? You know, it's it's much easier to start and say, okay, which companies are selling twice as much now as they were this time last year? Mm. And companies that can do that for two, three, four years, they're the ones that go up four, eight times. So that's basically it. I remember when we first spoke, I, the customer love thing was the thing yeah. I really remember. It was such mm. like a simple but instructive framework. And, um, you know, you when we first spoke, it was pre, it may have been in the COVID period, but it was pre, it was a few years ago. And you were investing in these fast growing, a lot of tech companies. And then also you have this masters of chemistry from Oxford and you use that expertise to invest in sort of biotech companies. So some of the faster growing, but riskier parts of the market. And then 2022 happens. And we want to take you back and uh, get your experience of, of the last few years because it was tough for growth and, and you were really focused on growth. So tell us about the last few years. Yeah, we're definitely at the pointy end of the sphere there. Uh, look, I, th- I think it's helpful to rewind kind of many, many years ago and just see how the, the cycle is, the cycles have kind of evolved and how that positioned everybody in the market. And then also where we fit in and, you know, kind of the mistakes, you know, things we got right and then things we got very wrong. Uh, so I think most living memory probably starts in the 90s for fund managers. So that was a period where value managers significantly underperformed. That was when a lot of people were opening up day trading accounts, kind of what we saw in, you know, a few years ago where everybody was opening up accounts and mm. be like, wow, like this guy's up three times. This guy's made 20 times in crypto. You know, this guy put hundred days. grand, he's got millions yeah. of bucks. Yeah. <laughs> it, was kind of, <laughs> it was an exciting time. You really felt like in six months you could make millions oh, of dollars. Yeah, you, know? Yeah. It was, you know, you really felt like it was, it was just that. Um, but that all happened in, in the 90s. So what happened there was uh, a lot of value managers were under huge amounts of pressure because the internet came kind of like you're seeing this AI boom here today where you know it's going to be big um, and you know, a, a very small number of companies are benefiting, benefiting from it. Um, but that was kind of like the first iteration. I mean, I'm sure that there were many, many cycles before that. But that was the iteration where people who are still around today and still investing today, you know, were either on one side or other of that. And there were many managers who really struggled. You know, that was when Warren Buffett was copying a lot of crit- criticism. Mm. Uh, there was the original Tiger Fund, which actually shut down. You know, there was so much pressure after decades of exceptional returns you know the fact that they couldn't make money for a few years when everybody else seemed to be making money hand over fist seemed like they'd missed that and literally got to the point where people were throwing in the towel Mm. um and you know some of the best managers did and then there was this spectacular multi-year bear market um which really the problem wasn't anything like that in tech um up until recently uh, and that's when you saw, you know, Microsoft and NVIDIA drop 90%, I think 95% for some of the major companies. And these are the ones that survived. You know, a lot of them, you know, you just never heard from again. And that changed the whole scene. So that was when a lot of the professional industry in Australia kind of made their reputation. So these are the much older guys. These are the people that run, you know, tens or hundreds of billions of dollars. They stayed away from, you know, the exciting tech stuff in the 90s. They were prov- they were wrong for a bit, but now proven very right. They survived. If you look at the really old mutual funds in Australia, often they got their outperformance in that period. Mm. Um, and basically, like, can you name a single tech fund with a trading history of more than 25 years? In Australia? Yeah, in Australia. No. Like, I, I don't think you can. Yeah. And I th- I don't, it's, very hard to, it's very hard to go back and find one in the United States. There might be like a couple. Oh, yeah. Um, but really, there's, there was no one. No one really survived that. Yeah. You know, there were a lot of value managers that survived um, the tech boom and the value underperformance and then did well in the back end. But very few fund managers survived a two and a half year drawdown where things lost almost all their value. Even the, even the companies that ended up being spectacularly successful, like NVIDIA and Amazon, to give like two obvious examples. Um, so that changed things. So then you ended up with a landscape where it was just full of value investors. Everyone was very skeptical of technology. Um, nobody really invested in that. Nobody wanted to allocate to people who are thinking like that. Uh, and of course, as night follows day, what happens is, you know, the next 20 years with a you know, tech just absolutely outperformed every single year. Mm. And then he could rank the success of fund managers based on what their view was on tech, what their view was on Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and the ones that, you know, had a little bit of exposure, did okay. The ones that were very bullish did exceptionally well. Uh, And everybody else struggled, you know, because those companies captured, you know, they wiped out entire industries. They took the entire advertising industry, you know, search, build basically every person, every company on the planet. Mm. Um, These guys were becoming an expense line on every other company around the world, capturing value from them and, you know, lifting themselves up. Uh, so that was broadly what happened. And then you enter the people like me who are much younger. And so we were kind of like 
pretty tech forward from, I guess, now it's quite a while ago, you know, 10, not quite 15 years, maybe 12 years ago. And then we outperformed, you know, we were interested in companies like Tesla, could see what was happening with Apple. It was crystal clear to us that the iPhone was going to be do extremely well. Software came out, this is amazing, fast growing, cool companies, you know, obviously want to invest in those. I think because everybody was so underweight those, they never really sold off in any serious way. So even in the financial crisis, you know, that was kind of 2007 to 2009. By 2009, all those companies were at new highs, whereas it took a long time, for, you know, your industrials and financials to recover. And those were sectors where some of those companies didn't recover. Uh, so really, again, it just became this period where there were very short, sharp sell-offs in tech. And basically where we made or where I used to make all my money was, you know, that'd be down 20, 30, 40 percent, get aggressive, buy them up, they'd double or triple on the other side. And anyway, that happened, you know, 2011, 20 a little bit in 15, but in beginning of 2016, there was a big moment like that. Um, in 2018, there was two moments like that at the beginning of the year. And in December 2018, all the way up to COVID, which was like the mother of all those short, sharp sell-offs, mm. where everything just got cut in half mm. or more, and then rebounded six weeks later. Yeah. And then we didn't just, like, we, we got hit really hard in those two or three weeks. You know, we doubled off that, that low and then doubled again and then went up another 50% after that, you know, all in the space of a year. It's crazy. Mm. I guess there were, a few fu- there were a few funds offshore that captured that move pretty well. So the two obvious ones were ARK and Tiger. And they went from being kind of, this is, this is the new Tiger, by the way, obviously related somewhat to the previous Tiger mm. um, in the sense that they all worked together at one point. But it was a new fund, different business. Those companies then were the ones that were outperforming. And I'd say in, actually, I'm not sure exactly, it was probably about around 2017, 2018, all the allocators just went from being very negative, that stuff, to just piling in. Um, and that push things to these crazy multiples. Um, and those perfor- those funds outperformed basically everybody. Uh, and that actually gave in Australia an opportunity for people like me who were on the right side of that to then raise a bit of money, make a name for ourselves. You know, I don't think many people, there wasn't much love for me in the professional industry because it kind of made everybody else look a bit like a dinosaur. You know, it's like, <laughs> why are you not investing in these fast growing tech companies? Like this guy is, you yeah. know, it's, it was that kind of thing. But then 2022 happened and, you know, we made a couple of mistakes. But I think the biggest one was probably about halfway down in, uh, it must have been like March, April, 2022. We're like, okay, this is it. You know, everything's down 50, 60%. It's time to get proper set in like the punchiest stuff we can find and really, you know, recover strongly from this. And then everything got like halved again. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and that's when you went from like having a bad year, but very recoverable to actually, okay, this is a really bad year now. Mm. Then our approach, obviously explosive growth, true customer love. We wanted to stick with companies while they're growing. And these companies were down a lot, but then a lot of them slowed down. That's when the software industry started contracting, losing seats, firing people. Like every time 10,000 people lose their jobs at one of these companies, one of these major tech companies, imagine how many software licenses they all had. Yeah, you know, yeah. Every software license churned. Um, and then that particular corner of the market to pick on software for a bit, they had adopted this very aggressive approach to stock-based comp where they would say they had huge free cash flow but pay out the developers enormous sums of stock. This was fine on the way up because there were always new buyers, there were always new retail people, new funds, allocators were allocating new money. There was heaps of takers for that stock. And then a lot of the employees held onto it. You know, they were believers as well. But then that all changed, you know, went from money leaving the sector. Uh, the people that were most kind of dogmatic about when you own these companies were the ones that did worse and money pulled out. And then employees, you know, if, you, if you're, in, you're in a stock and you've just seen your stock lose 80, 90%, you know, you get paid stock, you sell it, mm. you know, so every four years, whenever the, the vesting schedules came up, they, they hose it and they've been doing it ever since. And then I think then there was an opportunity for the industry to kind of adjust and go, okay, we're going to look for gap profits and actually move to profitability. And they certainly had those levers, you know, there's so much fat in those companies. Mm. You know, these are like the Twilio thing just strikes me. There was a report. This is late in the game. I think it was 22 or 23. So this is long after the crash. And the guy was paying like 30, 40 million US to all of these direct reports. He's a CEO. Wow. So he's sitting a year. A year. So he's sitting in a room. It's like this guy's like, he's not speaking to anyone that he's not personally paying less than like 25 million US. Yeah. You know, he's surrounded by it. And so obviously what's the stock going to do? It's going to get absolutely obliterated because mm. these people, like that's, that's, it might be 30 million US a year, you know, three years of that, it's almost a hundred mil mm. um, that you're going to sell. These aren't, and these aren't as big as they were. These companies aren't that large and there's certainly no one stepping in to say, okay, we need to buy these companies. Growth has slowed down. Uh, and the reality is that those companies just didn't recover. Um, there was a similar similar thing going on in, in healthcare where it became really fashionable to invest in platform companies. So you might remember CRISPR, it's like mm, gene yes. editing, we're going to yeah, like yeah. Um, change it. Yeah. And that those companies ran from, 
2016, like they've been around for a long, long time. They're some of the best performers. And again, absolutely obliterated, still, still burning so much cash. And like how many, like can you name a CRISPR treatment that's come to market? Like there's maybe one or two, you know, like CRISPR, the company CRISPR has got one approved. Uh, there's a company Blueboard Bio that got a couple approved but didn't make any money. Like these are really complicated things. You need to give people immense, like awful chemotherapy over many, many months. Um, it's a very complicated procedure, very expensive. Uh, it's it's not quite at the stage where even people that can get the treatment actually want to go through it. Like that chemotherapy and bone marrow transplants, that's what they're trying to avoid. It's not what they're trying to mm. um, access. So again, those companies didn't recover. You really got in this situation where there's this huge boom and this huge bust. And the reality is, is all the winners back then, they, the, with a few exceptions, which we can go into, um, didn't recover. Another mistake we made is it took a bit too, kind of recognized it, but got too long to get out of the mindset of we need to be in the most smashed up companies and really ride that two, three, four X recovery. And as of today, that broad based wave hasn't, hasn't come. Mm. And so the only way out of the hole for growth managers was to find new companies that were forming spectacularly well. Mm. Well, before we talk about the recovery on your side, I think uh, you've mentioned there, you've you recognized a couple of mistakes that you made. So how did you maintain conviction in some of those positions that you had and that style of investment? I think we can use Carvana as an example of stock that almost you almost 10 bagged, subsequently fell, what, 98% and then is on its way back. So kind of talk us through that and maybe then how your how that period has changed, if at all, the investment approach that you spoke about at the top of the episode. Yeah, I mean, I used to talk and think about it a lot because the dot-com crash was still loomed large. Like I wasn't around then, I was a kid, uh, but it still loomed large. And my approach was, you know, hold conviction, hold your Amazon. You know, it might be a couple of bad years, but you're going to recover. And, you know, those companies did 10, 20, 30 times afterwards. So if you spoke to me back then, that's what I would have said. Now I don't actually believe in that anymore. Um, <laughs> Because you can't, it's life's too short to spend a few years in a hole like if you can avoid it. Mm. So on the conviction point, it's really interesting because I think the way you lose a lot of money is to have a lot of conviction. Like if you're the, the traders and people who are actually trading momentum, for example, you know, once things are heading south, they tend to want to get out. Uh, and if you're systematic about it, you do get out. But you really have to have high conviction on something that then doesn't recover. That's how you lose a lot of money. Mm. Again, I think it comes back to that 20 year period in the lead up. You know, the people who had the highest conviction and held through all the dips kind of did the best. Um, but that was also, there's no guarantee that that was going to happen again. And really, it hasn't happened again. So I'd say holding conviction, yeah, Kavana's bounced. It's no longer down 98%. still down, what, 60 70% yeah. Mm. Yeah. from the highs. Like, you're not going to get a recovery there. And there's a very weird dynamic going on in Kavana where it became the most heavily shorted stock in the market or one of the most heavily shorted and certainly one of the most talked about. So when we bought it, nobody had ever heard of it. Like, if I talked about Kavana and, you know... Um, what did they have? Those vending machines with cars. Like nobody had ever heard of that. Mm. But by the end of it, everybody had heard of it. Everyone was talking about it. And everybody was short. Yeah. When it was down 98%, everyone thought it was going to go bust. It was losing a ton of money. Um, they're very smart operators, very cunning, very wily. Like they're very good at selling. These are the founders, very good at selling at the top. Um, they even bought a bit at the lows to kind of get their fundraising away. They massively cut costs. They bounce. And once that stock started rising with that heavy short interest, Basically, everybody had to buy back. Mm. Like you can, even if you've got a one or two percent short, you can't have that go ten percent against you. Um, it will kind of blow up your returns for that year. And so what's happened is one by one, as that stock's risen off the lows, short sellers have had to throw in the towel and buy back mm. to where we are now, where now the founders are selling again, which kind of gives you some indication of where <laughs> it is. It's still not going to. If you look at the gap numbers, it's still pretty ugly. It's still touch and go. But it's kind of amusing that the short sellers are getting such a hard time. And now having to buy back, you know, short positions at a loss. And they're, they're giving, literally handing the cash to the founders who are <laughs> selling into that short squeeze. Taking the money from their biggest attractors. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's another guy, there's a guy, uh, Nick Sleep, who I reckon he's lost a lot of money for people. <laughs> okay. If you have, if you yeah, have Nick Sleep. His, his letters are sort of known as the best after Buffett. Yeah. yeah. They're like super foxy. Like, we don't trade. We don't deal with brokers. We just... Sit on our five stocks. Yeah, and Co Costco. Do was it, and yeah, it's Costco yeah. and Amazon. It's yeah, like a yeah, show. Yeah. Got Costco and Amazon. A few things that did not quite as well, but that kind of popularized amongst a certain kind of professional investor, particularly boutique firms. That you should own like five or six stocks with high conviction. Mm -hmm. That's fine, but what if what if it's like Square or Twilio or Shopify or one of these ones or Carvana? It's Peloton. not. <laughs> yeah, Peloton. <laughs> any of these. Like really, it was. Yeah, they they didn't necessarily recover. 
Um, and that approach kind of, if you're just going to buy five stocks and you see yourself as somebody who shouldn't trade at all, then you're going to miss all the new opportunities that come as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has been a market, a lot of markets are like this, but in this market in particular, there's only a few stocks that are performing yeah. or that have performed uh, and they've captured the lion's share of the recovery. And if you went in those, then you didn't recover. So conviction is a way to lose money in a market like this. And, and you mentioned at the top there, um, it was customer love, explosive growth. And there was a third tenant now to your investment philosophy, which was this risk management approach. So tell us a little bit about that approach. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, I, I had a, always kind of knew that it would work. So for example, there's things that are like 100 years plus old. Like if you get a 100-year-old investing book, I'll talk about a, I think it'll be like a 50-week or 200-day moving average. And they're just like, when, when things are trending up, we're going to own them. We'll own stocks in the bull markets. We'll short them or not own them in bear markets. Like super simple stuff. Uh, like literally like century-old mm -hmm. kind of stuff. I kind of knew that would work, but I never tested it myself on the kind of companies that I, I invested in. With ChatGPT and AI, all of a sudden, everybody's a coder, right? Because <laughs> all of a sudden, you can build this stuff. You yeah. can just ask it to build that stuff. And in the past, I'd tried, but you kind of get stuck. Like I didn't do computer science. Um, you'd hit a roadblock, you'd spend a couple of days, make no progress, and then that was kind of it for a few months until you tried again. That was, that was my personal experience with trying to build these systems. But with AI, you can actually just build these systems and test certain things that otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. So another little thing we found out was it just said, like, super, what are some super simple heuristics, super simple rules that could improve our performance and what would have happened? And one of those was, what if you just sold everything that went up four times? or two or three or 10 or whatever. It turned out if you sold things at four times, we'd made a ton of money and we'd distribute it all as gains and we've been heroes. And so, yeah, there were a few things. Firstly, we, I, you can have, let's say something like NVIDIA now, super high conviction on it. The numbers are nuts. Like Microsoft is gonna quadruple their data centers. Mm. They're opening one every three days. Mm. You know, when they open them, they're at capacity in five hours. Oh, five um, hours? <laughs> yeah, this is, what, this is what one of the Microsoft people told us. Wow. It's like they open, they open up 100 a year, say, um, and they're originally going to open up 100 in a decade. They're going to do 120 now, yeah, 2028 or something. Yeah. yeah, and then it's gone from like 100 in a decade to 100 plus a year. Yeah. Um, and they're at capacity, you know, they're being used. And I don't think that's going to change in the near future. And all the hyperscalers are doing it the same. Mm. And they're kind of stuck. Like one of them can't say, I'm not going to invest in AI. I'm just going to leave that to everybody else because all, all the workflows and all those dollars are going to go to their competitors. So it's not just Microsoft, it's everybody. Mm -hmm. Actually, the interesting one is Meta. Meta's right up there, mm -hmm. Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that's interesting is because Microsoft and Google uh, sell their services, right? They have cloud computing platforms um, and Amazon, obviously. Yeah. But Meta doesn't. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're not doing it to sell on. They're doing it for other reasons, to train their own models and presumably really make money from every internet user like they do now for advertising, mm. things like that. Yeah. So you can have high conviction on that, but you know, the difference is, is now we owned NVIDIA, but we'll own it at certain times. And then we took our money when it went up four times, uh, which is more than enough to do okay every now and then. You know, you just need to catch a few of those swings. And the beauty of these kinds of approach, which is a bit more systematic, a bit more quantitative, is you will get a buy signal. You will get another buy signal. So it's not like you're out forever. You know, you're out until there's another crash and then you're mm. at some point you'll get another buy signal, you'll be back in. So that's the risk management approach on the way up, I guess, have uh, some rules around when to take profits. What about on the way down? Like what about if 2022 happened again? Are there any like heuristics that kind of... Oh yeah, I mean, even if, let's say you just test, I'll give you the simplest possible version would be like a 200 day. If you just own gross stocks when they're above and sell them when they're below, you'll probably, you'll miss every drawdown. You know, it'll be like 30% instead of 70 or 80%. Yeah. And then Carvana was an example, which I shared, you know, you apply something similar to that. Uh, you'd have made something like 25 times your money because you would have sold out and you've got back in at like 12 bucks mm -hmm. and you'd have made another 10X. Yeah. <laughs> so you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have got the first 10X, you probably would have got like seven or eight, and then you've got another huge uplift um, recently. And then depending how you set it, did you take money at four times, did you let it run, that would determine your outcome. But there is like no, it's, it's really weird when you take a quantitative approach because I know there's nobody that made that much money out of that stock. Mm. You would have heard about it. You know, you're, you've, yeah, you've yeah. seen a fund that just had some blowout returns. Like not a single person has traded that, that well mm. um, as like a, the simplest quantitative approach. And it doesn't work for everything, but it does work for super punchy stuff. So you can apply it to something like Whitehaven Coal. Uh, and because, you know, that's something that went up from zero to like six bucks all the way back down, all the way back up, all the way back down. It's, you know, it's, so you would have captured all those big swings, missed the big drawdowns, gone again. Uh, it works in crypto, it works in like really punchy stuff. You try to see, apply it to CBA, it's not going to work because mm. you're going to be trading in and out. You lose 5% each time mm. and 
the rallies are never going to be big enough to kind of make your money back. So yeah, there's two parts to it. So we'll sell stuff that goes down a certain period, which is very weird. Um, it's very different to what I, the way I used to approach these things. Mm. And we'll also take profits at very clear set targets, which seems to be about two and a half to four times. Okay. Seems to be the sweet spot. Nice. And we just hit a bunch of them. So now, you know, we've had a good year and we're sitting on more cash than we've basically ever had. Yeah, well, sounds easy. let's get to that <laughs> because that, that was sort of the hard part of the interview for you, talking about the tough years, 2022, start of 2020. Now you guys went easy on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now this is the part where you get to celebrate a bit because it feels like in some pockets of the market, growth is back. In some pockets, growth isn't back. But where it seems like it is back is in uh, your fund. And let me read this from your June investor update. Uh, the fund returned 32% in May, which combined with a greater than 10% move so far in June has taken to us for more than 80% for the calendar year to date. We're just halfway through the year and you've already done 80% for the year. So you must be feeling pretty good now. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've still got a way to go. I mean, we broke the first rule, which is losing too much money, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> got a lot got further to go. Um, but this was the last kind of, I guess, 10 months is where we've really just only been using, like really applied this risk model across the whole thing. So the first half of this, the first half of the financial year, we actually did pretty poorly because we had a bunch of med tech stocks which got obliterated in that GLP-1 oh, sell-off. Yeah, yeah. So we had some, we had some Novo and Lilly, but all that small mid-cap stuff got absolutely crushed. You know, we would have dodged that. If we'd applied the risk model of those stocks, we would have not had that drawdown and the returns would be much better. But then, yeah, there was a bunch of buy signals in November and the bounce from then was pretty ridiculous. You know, I think it was like 140% since the low in November. And now we've captured that, a big bulk of that, moved to cash. Now we're just going to, you know, earn 5% on that cash that we've got and just wait for the next set of buy signals. But to come back to the pockets of the market, it's not the whole period leading up to the crash. There were these big waves that pushed every stock up and down. You know, it was like all of software ripped and then sold off and then ripped and then sold off. Um, FinTech did the same thing. There was just these huge waves of money that were coming in and out of the market. Um, actually, that's an interesting aspect of the style and the, the companies we invest in, huge amounts of hot money. So you speak to value investors and, you know, um, even me like 10 years ago, you'd often have high conviction on something and they'll just go nowhere for two or three years. Mm. You know, we've never had that problem. Like that doesn't happen. You know, our stuff's <laughs> exciting. It's punchy. When it's moving, everybody wants a part of it. Fund managers, retail investors, that hot money's going to come in, but then the hot money's also going to go. So another way of looking at the, the approach that we've got now is we really want to monetize those rips. Mm. So when there is that like big wave of hot money and it pushes things up two, three, four times, we then want to be selling and taking those profits and waiting for the next time. And so how did that play out with NVIDIA? Because you've ridden that wave for a while. You don't uh, hold the position anymore, but it, I mean, has had a phenomenal sort of 18 months. It's also at the time of recording just had the worst three-day stretch in stock market history, wiping half a trillion dollars from its market cap. So how, how are you thinking about that? It's it's spooky. Like we just sold it right before that. Nice. On these systems. It's like, okay, sell now. It's like, okay, we're done. Like that was great return. Hopefully it doesn't double now. Uh, and then just sold off. It's very spooky seeing it in action. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not sure. With it. So basically at the beginning of this, it was only six months ago, right? Or seven, maybe November last year. It was trading at like low 20s PE. Like after tax gap, none of this kind of stock comp weird accounting mm. it was genuinely cheap on any basis and it was growing at well over 100 uh, percent and everybody knew it was amazing it was like this is probably one of the most obvious things you're, you're going to see you know at the very what growth just completely stopped the multiple would still go up 50 100 percent you know back to where it was you know the year previously now we're kind of at the opposite end of that where it's the multiples doubled from those lows i think drucker miller had he talked about it in video as well he's pretty good you know like he managed to capture that even as a guy who apparently knew very little about semiconductors you know a year ago as well and he said basically the market he put in a really interesting way it's like the market now sees what we saw so like it's not fully recognized the future so i think that that run is over for the short term but mm. the reality is is people need this this stuff i mean our whole lives sem from when we were like babies semiconductors have been one of the best performers mm. they've just periodically lost you know, 80 to 90% of their mm. value. Yeah, they've mm. been very cyclical. Yeah. yeah, and sometimes the cycles are fast. Like I remember in 2018, crypto, NVIDIA, so they do these GPUs, which is like compute multiple multiple streams of computation at the same time, as opposed to a CPU, which just kind of goes in a line. Um, it was for graphics originally, and then it just became perfect for crypto mining. Yeah. And there was this huge boom. And then there was a crypto bust, 
and then you know you, you can track the second hand values of these chips you know one um, one minute everyone's desperate to get them there's a big premium literally like months later there's a big collapse and then it was like almost before you could blink there's like a huge shortage again and then nvidia's like booked out their sales for the next year uh it was like the cycle was so fast sometimes and that was one of those one of those examples mm. but i'm not sure uh i think it's a tough one i think i'm, I'm pretty i tell you what i'm a lot more comfortable now having very clear take profit levels and very clear you know points at which would cut losses if we're in and, and the whole thing just reversed and I think that's the right way to play this because I don't, I don't think it's clear what happens next mm. because you could get a point where the hyperscalers thing actually invested too much um, because somebody has to use the hyperscaler serv- services, right? I definitely reckon that's going to happen. I, I it reckon, will happen. I reckon this, when. Is, this is like fiber optics in 2000 when everyone raised, the, there's a whole bunch of companies that saw the internet was the future and that investing in fiber optics was the right infrastructure play which they were right about. It just took like 20 years to play out and they all went out of business and the, all that infrastructure was kind of unused for a lot of time yeah. after the tech bubble burst. You can see it happening again now. Like, yeah, that was, um, you know, uh, do you remember seeing all those ads for, like you call Bangladesh for a cent? <laughs> no, I don't that? remember that. No, no. Maybe it's because like, you're traveling in hostels that always <laughs> like calling cards. Yeah, that okay. was because of the bust, the dot-com bust, where everybody laid all this fiber optic cable everywhere. Yeah, And then all those companies went under and then f- the new companies that ended up with the assets were able to sell like long distance phone calls insanely cheaply. There you go, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Bangladesh for a cent. So like <laughs> you, you can see that happening here. Like the, the, the thesis being right, AI is gonna change the world, all of that. But like the actual value creation not being there and you know, the hyperscalers aren't gonna go out of business, but yeah. Yeah, can- I'm not sure. It also happened, cause remember now there's a lot of companies that have raised a lot of money to buy Nvidia chips mm. and train models. But my personal view is, for what, for what that's worth, is that there'll only be three or four. And it's going to be Microsoft OpenAI. It's going to be Meta Llama as like the open source, relatively open source free one. Mm. Um, and there'll be Google with their, their platform as well, yeah. with Gemini. And they're Gemini. going to link it in with Search and they'll just work that into all their product suite. But then what's, so you've got a, a, a free slash open source-ish one. You've got OpenAI, which is probably the best partner with Microsoft, which is probably the best company to partner with. And then you've got Google. Where does that lead the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, yeah. eighth? Yeah. You know, th- these people are buying a lot of chips. So th- they're the companies that might not get the revenues mm. and all of a sudden be thinking, what do we what do, do we next? Do? Yeah. yeah. Um, and if you see them start dumping their chips, and I don't, I, we're, not, we're definitely not there today, but we could be there in like a year, six months, two years. Mm. Then that would, th- I think that's what it would look like when the cycle does turn. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then there's going to be. Yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll see. Let, I think enough has been spoken about NVIDIA, so let's put a pin in there and we'll, we'll get you back in when it starts ripping again. <laughs> but another company that has also done really well um, that's now actually the largest position in your fund is Clarity Pharmaceuticals. So a little bit less known than NVIDIA. So tell us a little bit about the company, I guess. And What happened in healthcare is the same thing that happened in the tech and growth space more broadly. But there's been some spectacular performers, usually because they've come out with some really good data. And so it has actually, in the, the biotech index is way off its highs. Um, and it's just been kind of floating around the bottom, bouncing sometimes, falling back down other times. But there have been some huge winners. Um, Clarity and actually Tilix as well, has to be said, it's now a $6 billion company. And I think it started at 50 mil not that long ago um, when it IPO'd. You know, those companies create a huge amount of value. And... Basically, what they do is it's ready pharmaceuticals are highly specific targeted um, agents for imaging and then also for treatment, uh, and they're very early stage. So there was another wave of development that was called ADCs, or antibody drug conjugates. That it was you get an antibody, you attach a drug to it. The antibody, you have two components. You have like a toxic payload, which is the drug, and then you have the antibody, which is super specific and like latches onto a target that you want. And then you can change around the payload, you can change around the target, uh, you can make it more or less specific. And then those companies are worth, some of them worth tens of billions of dollars and have been bought out at like huge sums. It feels like Radio Pharmaceuticals is like that, but at a much earlier stage. Mm. It's the same concept. You know, you have something that binds to a target and then a radioactive poisonous payload. Or in the case of diagnostics, obviously it's radioactive, so it just lights up. Mm. So if it's going, if it's binding to a very specific part, in like prostate or I don't know somewhere else in the body then that gives really good imaging uh, and it turns out that's been really helpful and really successful in prostate cancer uh, so Tilix and Lanthius both have basically generics because stuff has been around for so long 
generic products um, that allow you to test for recurrence and monitor prostate cancer. And those markets, going back to like that idea that often the best returns come when the market's much bigger than you expect, this was definitely one of those instances where people are saying, okay, there's this many patients, they'll need to be tested, the, market, the price is this, this is the market size. It's like, well, actually it was much bigger than that because the doctors are getting people to go back and get tested more and more often. Oh, um, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, and that's been exceptionally successful, even though those tests aren't actually that great. Like the sensitivity is pretty low, so they don't actually catch everything. I think it's, it's as low as 30 or 40 percent. It's actually pretty hard to find Just do the it actual again. numbers. And again. Yeah, do it again. <laughs> but it, but it's, it's proven that actually there's two things. It's like it's, there's no point having a diagnostic unless it changes your treatment plan. And there's no point changing your treatment plan unless it leads to a better outcome. Mm. And that's in the diagnostic space. It's kind of at that stage now where they can comfortably say that. Um, and that's why they've been such successful products. Mm. Now, the future of that is actually in treatment. Like that's what people really want to do. Uh, and there's one product in the market called Pluvicto for prostate cancer, which is kind of like a very late line treatment, which is effective in, I don't know, I think it's about 30% of people. I mean, prostate cancer is pretty nasty stuff. I think I didn't, because I was younger and also, there's this impression that it's curable and it often is, but the treatment is pretty horrific. Mm. Mm. Like, They'll remove most of your prostate. They'll give you these drugs that like remove like um, all the things that make you feel like a guy. Mm. Uh, they're very invasive procedures, very likely to be incontinent, impotent, like 50% plus likelihood. Wow. Really nasty stuff. Yeah. And then at the end of all that, you'll get a like heavy dose of chemo if you still got it. And then there's a lot of people at the end of that that there's still recurrence after that. And that's when you might try something like Pluvicto. Okay. Um, and why Clarity is exciting is they're still in an early dose escalation phase. There's a different agent, um, different radioactive payload, copper, different binding. So they've got much better IP than most of the people in the market. Um, but, you know, they announced a complete response in a heavily treated patient. Uh, they're in a dose escalation phase at the moment. So it's still relatively early stage. But, you know, they're getting phenomenal results in the people that they're treating, um, arguably very close to cures. Wow. You know, if somebody hasn't somebody's gone through the full line of treatment, nothing's worked, and then you give them this and they're kind of free of prostate cancer six months later. It's like effective cure. So that's why the market's so excited. And it's not just the market, it's also a big pharma. So they're paying like billions of dollars for companies with data that's mu worth, it's much worse than what Clarity's showing now. So what, I guess, people are bullish on the company now, you know, it's up five times or something this year. Yeah. People who are bullish on it now are going for that takeout. Yeah, okay. Um, or if not, you know, the fact that these things are funny because Telix has had such success and become a $6 billion company, all of a sudden clarity doesn't seem so expensive. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. a quarter of that, um, given that their early stage data is actually better in treatment, probably significantly better. Mm -hmm. It's up 575% in the last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, back to your risk management and selling on the way up. Like how how are <laughs> yeah, you true. how are you how, are you, I was, how yeah. are you thinking about oh, that? Painful. Well, I I did sell some at five x, um, but I think in this one I actually want to go for the takeout. I think there's yeah. enough, or or potentially even go the whole way because I think right now, the capital markets couldn't be more open to this company. If it does get taken out, it could be two to three x from where it is today. Wow. And I'm sure that whoever buys them will actually make many multiples more on that mm. if this does go to market. And it looks like it will. Wow. It, the whole biotech space is, you know, certainly outside my circle of competence. But every time I hear someone speak about it, it just makes me so excited about mm. the advances that are being made. Mm -hmm. Like, it feels like it's a good time for us to be alive in terms of the treatment options that will probably be available when we're older. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Mm. You know, every few years, these new drugs are approved every year. Yeah. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of these things in the pipeline. So Radio Pharmaceuticals, it's still so early stage. Like I said, it's Pluvicto basically by Novartis in the market. But, and, and that's like a late line treatment. Mm. And, but this has like very little side effects. Like it messes with your salivary glands, for example, and you get metallic taste. Compare that to being like impotent or incontinent. Yeah. Or like pissing mm. yourself when you laugh. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, ideally, that stuff is going to move to frontline, not just in prostate cancer and a whole bunch of other things. Mm. Uh, so that's like an opt optimistic take on where that field could go. And I think actually most people in the field would expect it to go there. Yeah. Mm. It's kind of cool that Clarity and Telix, both Australian. Telix is Australian. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, why is it that Australia is on the forefront of this? It's just a coincidence. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. And then I'm not sure um, there'll be people that say that, that would say that we're not at the forefront. Okay, Because <laughs> <All right. laughs> like, there's a lot of answer. other companies. There's a lot of perfect <laughs> Yeah, no, you're right. There's two, there's two players. It's Telix and Lanthius in that diagnostic 
um, phase. I don't know enough about it, but from the outside, it looks like they got lucky. Okay. And I'll say <laughs> they got lucky and then executed extremely well because I wouldn't want to underplay how hard it is to get hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue in the United States. Um, so phenomenal achievement. But basically when Nevada Scott Pluvicto approved, as part of that, they had to have a companion diagnostic, which is a generic, which would happen to be Tilix's. But when Nevada Scott Pluvicto approved, they also got their own generic, which is basically exactly the same, approved as well at the same time. Um, so if you want to use Pluvicto, you have to use Tilix's agent. Okay. Um, that's part of the approval process. But Novartis could have marketed their own generic. They just chose not to. Because they just didn't think there was going to be much money in it or something? Uh, I think that's a big part of it. But I think also they strategically... We think about big, big farmers that because they're so big and make so much money, everyone thinks they'll just you know buy everything and do everything. They don't. They're very strategic, very focused. Often they'll like cut entire programs at a time and say, we're not gonna even going to pursue any of the good work that we've done here. We're just going to focus on this, this and that. And big farmers basically said they're not going to focus on diagnostics. They're going to focus on treatments um, and leave that kind of diagnostic side to other people to fight it out. Uh, that seems to be what's happened wow. from the outside. Wow. Um, but again, I don't want to impinge on how hard it is to do what Tilix has done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. And also because they made so much money, they've been able to invest in other programs, mm. bring in other assets, develop other, you know, other potential revenue makers. So it's not a one-trick pony either. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Michael, to close out, we wanted to, I guess, have a conversation on where to from here. Um, some phenomenal returns year to date. Where are you looking at the moment in terms of industries, emerging technologies that are really exciting you and perhaps going to form part of the portfolio going forward? Look, I think we're always on the lookout for any company that's growing 100% plus. I think that's like often that's the number one on your filter. It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I definitely have a screen of over 100, percent and I I couldn't uh, tell you how often it works. 100 percent stock market growth or like revenue, revenue growth, organic revenue growth. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's pain. I've never, I haven't found a good organic revenue growth screener. There must be one out there. But you have to filter through. Yeah, all you the got, you got chat GPT. You yeah. could build one now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> I think it's going to be the same. I think the next few years will be the same. There'll be semiconductors will probably do pretty well. There'll be individual companies that are, you know, winning in their market that are growing super fast. They're going to perform exceptionally well. Uh, but it feels like it'll be a long time before there's that wave of money that just lifts everything up, you know, crazy amounts. And I think like our generation is just going to be a lot wiser and a lot, be a long time before everybody's buying junk stocks again. I think a lot of those companies aren't going to come back. And I think for example, like even something like FinTech, like there's so many payments companies like it used to be Square, now you see light speed everywhere. You know, payments are just information. Like there's, that's a real race to the bottom in margin. It's uh, buy now, pay later back. <laughs> 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 I mean, selling that company for 39 billion, wow. Yeah. Is no, that no, no, no. Pay? Best, that is that's one of the all time wins yeah, out of the Americans. Yeah, yeah. Best timing yeah. ever. Nailed yeah. it. Yeah, imagine it was like in that room doing that negotiation. Oh, no. It's like, they must have played it so well. Like yeah. word perfect. Yeah. yeah. Just killed it. Yeah. Yeah. Credit. Well, you know, Zip, it's up more than 100% this year. Yeah, Zip's done well. Yeah. I keep hearing about it. It's just, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't own it, but it's no. not, just, not to say it's not going to do another 100%, mm. but I, th I think it's hard if you, like my view is actually payment margins go down for the next few years, potentially throughout our lifetimes. So with that headwind and a ton of really well-funded companies, remember these companies that are down 80, 90%, they're in no risk of going under. Like it's very strange. They pay their they their one big cost, and that's developers, um, and they pay that in stock. So these companies are going to be around competing with each other for a long time. It's a really toxic dynamic. But everybody has money. Nobody nobody's going under. Nobody's like there's not like some big consolidation pay where they're all joining up. You know they just and the people in these companies are quite happy. They're all very well paid. You know they're getting huge stock grants every year. The fact that their stock from four years ago is down so much isn't that relevant. You know, they're probably selling the whole way through. Like, I think it's just going to be a very competitive place. Probably a good place to be a software developer and a bad place to be a stock investor. Mm. That's kind of my view. I mean, it could be wrong, but that's just how I see that whole fintech mm. payments area. Yeah. Well, uh, Michael, I think that's a good spot to leave it. Thank you for joining us. It's been a great conversation. Um, and we can't wait to get you back on and hear how it's all going. Great. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks, Mike. Great to have a chat. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.